Hello everyone, welcome back. So welcome to another episode of the new series, My Most Loved Fragrances. Thank you to all the viewers who've given really good feedback on the episodes that we've had so far. I've uh, been really, really thrilled with that. So hence, I'm doing quite a few more of these and uh, they're, they're turning out great so far. So we've had some absolutely superb guests. I've started off with the first couple with fellow YouTubers and just recently, we are now beginning to uh, move into other fields because we have perfumers on the show too. So it's, it's getting really exciting. And today we've got a, an absolutely fantastic perfumer all the way from Canada, Matthew Meleg of Meleg Perfumes. Hello, Matthew. Hey guys, cheers. Um, I'm just taking some jugs, so don't worry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, How's Great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me. I've, I've interviewed you once before in a more general way about your fragrances, uh, but today it's this uh, the special format. So as you have been told a few moments ago, and other viewers may hopefully remember, the format of the show is to, for you to tell us about your five most loved fragrances, most cherished fragrances, uh, yeah. perhaps fragrances that have the most uh, significance in your life or your fragrance journey, that kind of stuff. Not necessarily just the best five smells in your collection at the moment. And as you are a very uh, increasingly well-known and respected perfumer yourself, what I do is insist that we have one fragrance as well as the other five that is one of your own that you, you'd like to pick, which you can throw in at any moment in, in the list. Uh, but before we do that, we like to get to know our guests a little bit more uh, with a few general questions about life, etc. So I'm going to kick off with that subject. So, of course, you're over in Vancouver, Canada. And at the moment, without getting too heavy, I'm always asking guests how are things with the general pandemic, lockdown situation, etc. in Canada at the moment. We're doing okay, you know, I mean, um, the city's not locked down. Um, uh, Vancouver City has a very, um, the people here are really uh, about compromise and we're a rule following sort of culture in this city. Uh, people are careful. Um, so I think we've been doing the best job we can, you know. Um, it's going okay. It's going okay. We can still go out to the bars and restaurants and cafes. Uh, the tables are kind of divided with the plastics. And so, um, I mean, you know, just a couple more months till spring comes and that's what we're trying to do, you know, make, make it through to the spring. And I think when spring comes, um, and the air dries up, you know, less humid, I think that has a huge effect on, on, um, the virus so and and you know the shots are coming there's been a little bit of slowdown eh, with uh, some of the shot um, uh, manufacturers but that's to be expected I'm optimistic I'm optimistic I think I think we'll do okay good I like yep. your attitude I think you're right that uh, we're, we're probably in the worst of it worldwide at the moment but once spring comes that, that's got to help and the vaccine, obviously, is, is going to be a huge thing, even if it's just going to take a while. And uh, I'm really glad and slightly jealous to hear that you've got a, rel a little bit more normality than here. At the moment in, in uh, the UK, it's a little bit more of a serious lockdown and uh, no bars or anything are open. So it kind of sucks a little bit, I have to admit. But like you, I, I believe that by this time next year, it won't be gone, but we'll be on top of this thing. Let's hope I'm right. Months from now, life will be back to normal. I think I'll be traveling in, in, in the summer. I I'm, like your optimism, yeah. I'm yeah. not booking a holiday yet, but I'm optimistic it might be at least a, a possibility before too long. Okay, now, on the subject of you, more generally, um, you're over there in, in, in Vancouver, you grew up in Canada, uh, and now, you are known to us. The reason why you're on the show is that you are the man behind your own perfume range, Meleg Perfumes. I always forget whether I should say parfums or fragrances with people, but it's Meleg Perfumes on the bottles that I have here. Now, I feature them quite a bit on the show. I would like to stress that I actually bought with my own money from my paper round, Golden Guy, uh, which is an absolutely amazing tobacco-based fragrance, kind of boozy tobacco decadent fragrance which you themed after. I, I won't mention it in too much detail because you may be going to talk about it later. I don't know. Uh, but it's a, a fantastic decadent fragrance themed after the Golden Guy uh, area of Tokyo, which 
is a bit like Soho here in London or something, a, a slightly uh, decadent place. Um, a really good one. And then you did actually very kindly sent me Meleg Fougere, because it was kind of a no-brainer that Mr. Smelly would like that one. Um, um, apart from just the, the fantastic creational skills that you've put into these, another unique feature which viewers I think will be very interested in if they don't know, is that you are not complying with IFRA regulations in your ingredients. So we've got real oak moss and some other ingredients that might not be found in your department store niche fragrances. And we've got very strong concentrations, I think, of, of the fragrance oils. And you, you really refer back to old school recipes as a starting point for your own very unique modern niche brand. So j just tell us a bit about what's going on at the moment with, with your brand and your create your creations. Well, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, uh, Canada, United States, we're a little bit spoiled over here. Our IFRA regulations are kind of optional. Um, we can adhere to them or not. And just as I was learning to study and, and work with perfume materials, I didn't want to um, lock myself in or limit myself in any way because I want want, want to always want to learn as much as I can um, about perfume and, and life in general so these old materials uh, they're really fantastic they're so thick and rich and not to say that you can't make absolutely beautiful perfumes that are if are compliant you can and um, it might be that some of my perfumes are IFRA compliant just by chance, but I don't build them that way. So if I send them away for analysis, who knows, maybe they are. Um, but I don't build them with the intention of um, limiting any of the materials. Uh, definitely like the history, exactly as you say. Love history, history buff. Um, Love all sorts of history, war history, um, European history, British history, Canadian, everything, all places. Love the history of perfumery. Um, and that's basically how I got my brand started, basically through curiosity. Wanting to know the materials, wanting to know the history of perfumery. And that's where I'm starting and always going forward, learning new stuff all the time, all the time, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, as you say, the, the, you don't necessarily set out to make them non ifra compliant. Some of them may be uh, complying with the rules, but yeah, you certainly don't uh, force yourself to be constrained by that, which I think is really, really good. And a lot of my viewers are always going, oh, this one, this old fragrance that I like was reformulated, yeah. and I'm really upset about the no more oak moss. So, at least it's great that there is somewhere you can get them. Uh, what I should have said earlier is, I'm going to provide a link to where you can find out more and buy the fragrances from Meleg uh, Perfumes. And it's an Etsy site, isn't it? So, uh, and that ships worldwide. So, I ship it's worldwide good news. and I ship it to you as cheap as possible. Um, I write a fair price on the import. So, guys, don't worry too much about that. Um, yep. And I do whatever I can to make everything easiest for the receiver of the package. Mm -hmm. I ship everywhere, anywhere. Um, there is no problem with me sending IFRA non-compliant perfumes to Europe. Yeah. From here to directly to to customers, that's not a problem at all. Yeah. So very lucky that way. I have a standalone site, um, which I'm always improving, and I have the Etsy site and. Um, go on there check out the reviews I update I have a pretty cool Instagram um, and uh, once in a while I go off topic I write some weird stuff on my Instagram and then I erase it later on but I just stick to perfumery <laughs> so. okay brilliant I'll also link your uh, your Instagram because that's definitely a good, a good place to, to check out for some daily posts and yeah, we've had some great reviews for these uh, from many people on the internet. Also, Wafts from the Loft channel, I think, featured them, didn't they? Yeah. And I know a lot of my viewers are into the old school fragrances or the, the kind of more purest end of the niche stuff, really like their channel too. So that if they uh, do a bit of uh, Googling or YouTube searching, they can soon find that their thoughts on these. So check them out, guys. And we'll be hearing a little bit more, I'm sure, about how the, uh, your journey has, has impacted your own creations. So 
On to the next question, which, which sort of links to your, your fragrance brand a little bit. Yeah. And I ask every guest this. And this is how and at what point did you discover that you were inordinately interested in perfumes? And at what point did that translate to actually want, wanting to become a perfumer? Good question. Um, my 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 parents uh, were not together, right? Divorced. My uh -huh. mom, mother was in the city. So when I went to visit my mother in the city, I always went to the kind of gorgeous, beautiful shopping centers that you don't have in the countryside. And in my mind, there was always a link between perfumery art, my mother's artist, um, sophistication, and just things, places, people, stories, cultures, and a kind of fantasy landscape in my mind that was connected with perfumery, the fast pace of the city, stores, um, you know, luxury, that sort of thing. Perfumery are always, it kind of locked in my mind, okay, so it was something over there and I would visit my mom once a year or every two years or something like that or sometimes every six months and then I return back to the farm. Now the farm, of course, it has its all like, hundred. it's filled with beautiful scents as well. So I sort of fell in love with perfumery um, and perfumes that way because it was connected with my mom, connected with the city, um, connected with an exotic place in my mind, right? A place away from the farm, some, some kind of really cool, interesting, you know. Um, so, so that, I think that's, it's fair to say I fell in love with perfumes in, 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 in that context and within my mind. Um, you know, hotels or travel, um, department stores, um, you know, gold interiors or, or, or um, Toronto has, it's, it's like a small London, it's got quite beautiful um, uh, hotel lobbies and that sort of thing. And, and when, when I visited my mother, uh, we would go uh, to these uh, very interesting places. So, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I, f I fell in love with perfumes in that way as, as something exotic and um, kind of a treat for oneself, you could say, I think. Everybody kind of has that, you know, um, exotic sophistication, um, refinement, art association with perfumery. Okay, that makes good sense to me. Yeah, and, and so it was, it was from a very early age then because sometimes we have guests and you know, it was only in their twenties, or you know, a couple of years before they started their YouTube channel or whatever that they suddenly got got interested. But it, it was there for you right from the really early days. Yes, not a specific perfume um, per se, but uh, perfumes generally. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that makes good sense to me. Okay, so that let's assume that you always had a slight interest in this, or more than a slight interest. Then, fasting, fast forwarding quite a long way. At what point did it actually occur to you that you wanted to make perfume? It, I would say just, I started making perfumes only about five years ago um, as a self-driven activity, something to do in, 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 in my free time. Um, I always, I was always a self-driven sort of, um, I spend a lot of time alone and, and, and for me that's like not really a negative thing. I love working on projects and creating, um, you know, I, I had studied art and fine arts in, uh, in, in college um, and uh, it was, I believe, after a couple documentaries I saw about perfumery or agar wood on YouTube um, that I had realized, you know, within a single bottle of perfume, there's such a, so many materials, so many stories, so many natural, um, uh, you know, materials, plants, vetivers, grapefruits, uh, you know, jasmine, all, it, every material has these 
all these connections with all these different farmers and processing plants and, and chemists and uh, you've got the whole world inside of a bottle of perfume. So it was these uh, documentaries um, that I came across on YouTube that really drove my interest towards, oh, okay, uh, so I bought a bunch of um, perfume, or sorry, essential oils uh, and sort of smelt them and wrote down what I thought about the perfume and what I smelt. Uh, you know, an essential oil is essentially like a tiny little perfume in and of itself. It's uh, a single essential oil might have like 300 different molecules and it's got so many facets and you can really study and sort of um, concentrate on uh, that thing before you putting language to something you smell. And for me, it was kind of an addictive process, this putting language to what something smells like and it just sort of grew from there. So I never had any intention at all of other smell or selling perfumes. Never, I, I, it wasn't my intention. I just genuinely liked studying uh, the materials and just wanting to know more about um, perfumery. And I think the fact that there are so few perfumers in the world uh, that you know, I thought that was interesting too. Hey, why don't I teach myself something that not a lot of people do? You know, why not, right? Um, it kind of makes you feel a little bit special in a little bit of way, you know. Um, so, so, so that drove me towards uh, uh, learning about uh, materials inside of perfumes and how they're grown and what they smell like. Yeah, just curiosity, really. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I mean, the uh, the that happened maybe five years ago. How yeah. long? ago or how recently did you actually start selling the fragrances for oh, Meleg perfumes i think it's been like exactly a year or something like that Is it, oh i thought it was more like two. Oh, great oh wow okay so you're that new yeah i didn't realize it was it was that kind of go and work it yeah. out 2019 i started selling wow okay so very very new brand um and uh, i really really think that guys who are into my styles of stuff that i sometimes like would do well to check these out however that's not to say that they're all um green old men's food shares that I like. There's quite oh. a lot of really exotic ones and, and absolutely fascinating fragrances there, which I hope we'll have a chance to, to mention a few more as we go forward. Um, all right, now, I guess I better get onto the, the official subject of the video, which is your five most cherished fragrances. As I say, no particular rules. So what one would you like to talk about first, please? Um, let's do... Uh... Just vanilla. <laughs> Is that okay? Yes. What, just vanilla? Just vanilla. Okay, okay. great, we, great, great. We can talk about Angel by Mugler. We can talk about, let's say we talk about that, or we'll talk just vanilla. Um, <laughs> because it's got such a strong association um, of, you know, my first high school girlfriend, right? Ah. Okay. Go on. Vanilla is very, very sweet, uh, and it's a long bean, you know, um, primarily made or grown in Madagascar. It's actually, it, probably you know this, Dan, but it, 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 it's an orchid, you know, vanilla? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's the orchid flower. Ah. From the orchid, it's, and, but it has no smell in the beginning. So in Madagascar, or actually a small island off of the giant island of Madagascar, off the coast of Africa, they take these orchid um, flowers or orchid beans, the vanilla pods, and um, they lay them out and they let them rot. And it's actually the rotting process that gives it this very, very sweet, um, very sweet uh, uh, smell, you know, vanilla, right? So, mm. vanilla for me is like, um, it's got, um, it, it cannot be um, taken away from sex at all. It's 100% sex. Yeah. Vanilla means t sex to you. Uh, a thousand percent. Vanilla. Explain. Woman for me. <laughs> a straight guy, right? So, for right. me. Right? Okay, so um, vanilla is 
So I, I don't know what your experience was like in high school, but basically the general rule in Canada um, for high school students is that nobody in high school really knows how to apply, you know, just a little bit of perfume. <laughs> right. Or, um, you know, the girls, they, you know, they very often would like cake on the makeup. More is better. When you're in high school, you want to drink like, have contests where you drink like a case of beer or you smoke like an ounce of weed in one night and you brag to everyone just how far you've pushed your limits. Yeah, and, okay. Well, you know, the guys will spray themselves with Axe body spray every single inch of it because, you know, I mean, common sense would have you, um, I, it's obvious, isn't it, Dan? Like a tiny little spray of Axe body spray, if the girls like it, mm. if you use half a bottle, they're going to love you right it's so, logical yep yep yeah, it's very logical yeah. it's the same thing with the with the girls in high school you know a little bit of spray and um and if you cake yourself with uh with with uh the perfume the boys come running mm. which is kind of true like if everybody's drunk and at a rave or something like that and your senses you can't really key on to anything so if you're really locked into the fragrance um mm -hmm. It's kind of like you know, like a fly flying towards the bug zapper. But anyways, um, so uh, I can remember Vanilla, um, my very first girlfriend, um, the first girl, you know, that I ever French kissed, right? Well, um, she uh, wore a very vanilla, strong, sweet, edible smelling um, vanilla perfume. And I can't tell you exactly which one it was. But um, all I know is it made me like really horny and because she would spray it like on her chest and she would put um, sparkly uh, makeup here, right? And right. young people, so young people, like they look good no matter what. They work out, don't work out, whatever, you know. So we're both very firm and young and she had great shape to herself. Um, so... <laughs> Remember, you know, just like making out in like cornfields. Of course, I'm from the countryside. Um, I just remember the smell of vanilla and waking up in the morning and my body like covered in mud. And um, it was totally worth it, you know. It's, <laughs> so vanilla and, and a very funny thing, vanilla comes from the Latin word vagina. Which really? Sheath. Yeah, yeah. It means like sheath or pod. Um, because of the way it looks yeah because of the way it looks and if you look at orchids flowers they look vagina like in shape um, it's been so long since I saw one that I, I wouldn't know but I'll take you <laughs> I'll take your word for you <laughs> I vaguely remember yeah who, who is that American um, female um, painter she was she was married to the very famous photographer um, Ooh, I don't know what was her name? Uh, American painter. Um, O'Keefe. Uh huh. So Miss O'Keefe, she would do lots of George O'Keefe. So if you look at her paintings, the vagina vanilla, or sorry, sorry, the the, the vanilla orchid, which is a plant. Um, mm. And vagina shape, it's very um, there for you. And right. it has just associations with sweet food, baking, cooking, warm house, um, the domestic, right? I think mm -hmm. something comforting and warm about vanilla. And for me, it just talks like a woman. It's a very feminine thing. Oh, okay, that's really good. Yeah. I like that. Okay, so yeah, I like what you're saying there. It makes sense to me. Uh, certainly, I, I agree. The last thing that you said about the the comforting type of thing, like right? I mean, it, there's almost nobody in in general life who doesn't enjoy the smell of vanilla in you know whether it be custard or a bakery and all that kind of thing. I mean, yeah, we all we all like it. I guess some people, some men may not prefer it in men's perfumes so much because they think it's it, as you say. It kind of, I would say it, it leans towards feminine connotations for most people. Hadn't thought of it being specifically a sort of sexual thing, although I get what you mean that, especially, I, get, I think young girls back in the day and probably still now, and it would be a pretty typical thing to have a very sweet 
vanillic type of fragrance. I get that. Um, oh, yeah. I think probably the when COVID's gone, you go yeah. and you see like all like the high school girls in their youth are in their you know high school girl uniforms. They're gonna all smell like super sweet perfumes, probably. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that obviously naturally would be a great a great memory of growing up and for first uh, dalliances. Actually, I think for you guys, it's probably a bit different. High, high school is like your age is kind of what 12 to 16 kind of age 13 to 17 or 18 yeah okay so it was what we would call secondary school here now i think over there i don't know what it's like now but we we wouldn't have had a culture where many people were wearing strong fragrances of any kind at school of course we wear these school uniforms here so the idea that you guys are sort of being yourselves and expressing yourselves and dressing how you want as you have throughout North America, most other countries is much more of a thing, whereas we have our, our slightly um, repressed English system where the kids wear uniforms. So although there were some attractive girls and people blossoming a little bit, I don't remember people sort of, obviously they couldn't dress how they wanted, and I don't remember smelling a lot of perfume. So uh, I guess your, your set up there is a little bit like all these old school movies I remember watching, Ferris Bueller's Day Off or whatever, yeah. uh, Pretty in Pink and that kind of thing. Where I know that's America, not Canada, but where, where people, you had the kids with this style and the gothics and the, the jocks and the cool kids. You have all of that kind of culture, fashion culture. So it makes yeah. sense that the fragrances would be a more everyday part of you guys' lives over there. All right, love it. Yeah. What's fragrance number two, please? Um, fragrance number two, uh, let's go with, um, um, let's go with Terra de Hermes, I guess. You surprise me, Why? Matthew, <laughs> because it's such a mainstream smell, and, uh, I think if you, I associate you with smells that I don't smell every day in your own curations, but uh, go ahead, Why, what is it that you like about it? I really like it too. I, it, it's absolutely a very harmonious perfume. It's so well constructed. Um, the thing that I like about it, and I have it here on a scent strip, is I think it, uh, as I was telling you, you know, I used to go on these vacations to visit my mom um, in the city, you know, me from the countryside, go to the city. And one of the first really, um, I thought it was quite different at the time of smelling it. Um, and I think it still is quite unique actually, but you smell it all the time. But um, it's the pepper notes in, in, in Terre de Hermes, um, Hermes, Terre de Hermes, um, that really caught my attention. And I can remember sampling it. And I think it was a, one of the first very, very thick perfumes. Um, the original came out, um, it, it's still maybe quite thick and resinous and maybe I was trying like the um, the 30% version, like the Eau de Parfum or, or, or yeah. Eau de Tract or something. Like that. But it was a very thick, oily and peppery perfume and so lively. And I really associated that with um, life in the city with sophistication with the things that you know i didn't have in a small farm and then as i went uh you know as i'm studying perfume and i looked at um really studied it it's such a fascinating harmoniously well-built perfume that only a man or a woman or whoever a perfumer that really knows the materials could ever possibly construct because it's not a particularly um, long formula. I think it's maybe only like 40 materials, could even be less or something like that. It doesn't smell dense, but every single material that's in there just really locks in with the next material. So I have such like a, a technical um, appreciation for it. And it's probably, it's definitely my, I think I, it's fair to say, it's my favorite um, vetiver perfume. It's transparent and it's vetiver at the same time and everything within it celebrates the vetiver. So 
I, I love it. Um, so I'll just give you a breakdown of my appreciation. I made little cards. So in case. Uh, you, go on. Mm -hmm. So this is vetiver, right? And it's the root. Right? Vetiver yep. are these roots. And so when you smell vetiver essential oil, it's a very rooty, earthy, um, lightly peppery material. It's, it's woody, it's earthy, it's rooty. But the way that they actually extract uh, the essential oil from this is it goes through a very, um, the roots, the rootiness, the earthy, the, the, wood, the woody, the, 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 the dense, uh, the cool, the cool, rooty, earthiness, it goes through the extraction process and it's very, very high temperature steam distillation. And it takes on a burnt smokiness. So vetiver essential oil is simultaneously this cool, earthy, rooty, um, very masculine, down to the earth, you know, farmer, uh, rural setting with this addition of the smoky smoky distillation process so you have the earth you have the smoke you have the wood and slightly spicy too um, because it's roots you know if you think mm -hmm. of um, uh, ginger or something it's got that um, spicy aspect to it a bit peppery and so i know that there's a lot of uh, there's vetiver in this perfume and then off the top notes, sorry, and then another material that's really a lot in this perfume is ISOE Super. Have you ever smelt it alone? No. I, I was aware that Terre d'Hermes is, is described by some people as an ISOE Super bomb. And I feel like I have a sort of understanding of when I smell that there's quite a lot of it in something. But... Yeah, I, I never claim to be good at knowing all these essential oils. So yeah, pl please enlighten me a bit more about that. Iso East Super smells like cedar wood that's been steamed with mineral water. It's an I like it. absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous. Like this is like an Onsen bath, mm -hmm. and right um, mm -hmm. where I used to live. I lived there for a decade, and you can go in these. Um, Cedar wood baths where the water comes up from the earth like 3,000 feet or mm -hmm. 1,000 feet down below, many thousands of meters, and it's mineral water. And the mineral water steams the cedar planks. And I swear, this is exactly what ISO E super smells like. It smells like this um, Finnish sauna or Japanese sauna or onsen. You can smell the warmth of the cedar, the oil of the... Uh, the cedars it, i saw you super it's this masculine but it's also very errant so what it does in combination with the very dense rich vetiver is it smooths it out it brings a kind of buttery cedary softness to the to the vetiver so that's locked in there like it's a natural like woody with woody warmth with warmth um yeah. The minerals of the dark soil in the vetiver locked in with like the kind of soft, smooth, um, uh, mineral salty aspects of uh, ISO E Super. And both of them actually have nuances of pepper too. So another big part of um, Terre de Hermes is actually the peppery part. And he uses a lot of, I think, pink pepper. Uh -huh. Pepper is this bright, you know, peppery, woody, spicy, warm material. And then on top of all this, you have his choice of um, citrus materials, which are, which is grapefruit. Okay, so grapefruit, it's not like orange. It's not like a sweet orange. Grapefruit is more like a, this flat, woody, pithy. Do you understand what I mean by pithy? Yeah, I think it's the white bit in between the skin and, yeah. So it's the most, what's the word? Sharp, tart, do you say? Dry. Sorry, we, say it again. Tart and dry. Sorry. Tart is a good, good word, yeah. We know what the pith means, I think, yeah. So this tart pithiness is also found in vetiver. 
and the vetiver and grapefruit is a very common combination. You know, it's this bitter citrus, dry citrus. Mm. And then finally, all together, what he does to lock these materials in is he brings it together with a magnolia um, flower material. And are you familiar with the smell of magnolia flowers? No. I will be frank. It's a very nondescript, chalky, dry flower. Mm -hmm. Like a flower that wasn't grown specifically to smell nice. Mm -hmm. So it's like a nondescript, chalky, also pithy. It also has um, citrus aspects to it. So just his choice of materials in this perfume, it's so well done. Mm. It's so harmonious. And so that is my number two perfume for sure. Uh, um, for today's choice, it's 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 a beautiful creation. Okay, that is a superb choice. I am a big fan of it too. And it was really great to hear that, that breakdown from someone who understands the how this stuff works because i don't so i'm like uh, oh it smells like a, an orange has been rolled in earth and that, that's what everyone says on youtube and but but it's good to hear it from a more technical proper standpoint and i like it was great to hear your description of iso e super too i really like that that it works actually now that i think of it the cedar with the mineral water still very good uh, that somehow captures it better than many other descriptions i've heard i think it's a hard thing to describe isn't it iso e super because a lot of people say oh molecule oh one the famous fragrance that is just iso e super super smells of nothing and yet of something at the same time but you uh, that doesn't help us but your description did which was really good and a superb 2006 release from perfume jean claude eleanor i think there's a story about sort of the, the connecting the earth to the air and that kind of stuff it was quite a an RT description that he gave us, but it's really good to hear that technical des description and undoubtedly one of the great masculine releases. Thank you so much for enlightening us about that one. What's number three, please? Number three has got to be Jiki because you can't talk about ah. three without talking about Jiki by Guerlain. Mm -hmm. uh, the famous early 20th century release. I think like 1910 something. When was mm. it released? 1889. Sorry, that's right. Wow. So Jiki is um, every perfumer knows Jiki, um, mm. and it was made by Amy, Amy Gerlain, um, and it is a really fascinating um, uh, uh, story. So basically, you know, Amy's dad. Okay, so Gerlain. What's Gerlain? Um, mm. Amy's dad, Pierre right, Peter, he, he made um, Guerlain, I think, around, oh, uh, 1830 or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, um, Pierre, he was a uh, pharmacist, um, so or an apothecary guy, right? And back in the day in Paris, all they would do is um, sell very, very simple, simple, simple perfumes. Um, they would get... Uh, they would sell like citrus, like um, a perfume that's basically 99% citrus, maybe a little bit of benzoin and some rose or something. Um, and for about 40, oh goodness, um, maybe 40 years, uh, Pierre, um, along with his sons, they were making these very simple, but they always got their materials from very good sources from the Italians or Arabs or anybody else they could. And they provided very high quality, very simple colognes, very simple, pure rose perfumes, very simple, maybe pure jasmine perfumes, something like this to uh, um, the government uh, higher ups in France and, and European royalty. Um, I think they even, um, yeah, they were actually a perf the perfumer family for the Queen of Belgium. That's what it was. And, uh, Amy, his son, right? Um, Peter's Pierre's son was uh, always looking out for really interesting materials. 
And there's kind of a lot of legends around Amy, um, whether he was gay or not gay. His name was both masculine and feminine. Um, he is named after uh, possibly um, Jock or um, uh, his nephew or named after a girl, but that's an aside. Um, anyways, he, he was uh, made possible uh, because of the discovery of coumarin, um, linalool, and vanilla. Mm -hmm. Right. So you had the perfume house and their relationship with um, uh, manufacturers of, of new chemicals, right? And of course, uh, um, the very first perfume to ever use any kind of synthetic was, uh, or one of the very first was, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Hubigant? Yes, Fougere Royale, you know, with Kubrin, yes. Yep. But what Jiki did is Jiki was basically Fougere Royale plus vanillin plus um, uh, tonka bean, mm -hmm. more coumarin, <clears throat> more rosy, more middle notes, and um, so it was like a far more, it was basically a, a Fougere Royale plus an amber. Mm -hmm. so full spectrum of the perfume. It would start off, if you smell cheeky, it starts off with like lavender, rosemary, bergamot. It's very bright. Yeah, it is. Smell off the top, you can smell the civet in there too. So it's a very three-dimensional perfume. That's why I love it. It's got, it's got the animal, and then in the dry down, it's got the amber. And mm. this is the first time in European history where a perfume, I could say probably perfumery, caught up with the sophisticated levels of perfumery reached by India many thousands mm. of years ago. Because the Indians, they um, had their attar um, creative process where they could create very, very sophisticated um, perfumes far more than anything um, anybody in Europe done. But I think with the invention of Chiki, this is the first time that a very complex, you know, highly developed um, perfume. What I mean by highly developed or, or sophisticated was this perfume was not made to copy something in nature. It was a work unto itself. Yeah. Right. So that's why I love um, Jiki and um, really, really interesting perfume. I think one of the best ever made. And you can spend, I could, I could spend all my life making like versions of Jiki. <laughs> you know, you can increase the amber or you can increase the animal of it or you can increase the freshness of it. These are like three main facets found in all Perfumery, it's kind of interesting because now, after Ifra came along, we kind of went back in time, mm. way from these sophisticated, three-dimensional, um, nearly Attar-like, you know, uh, mm. perfumes, something more, something more simple, almost, in a way. Mm. They are more... Um, are, 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 I feel less impactful, less characterful, but there's some beautiful perfumes now. So, but anyways, so Jiki is gone. Okay, I love that. Yeah, um, Jiki, of course, one of the ones I notice actually a lot of perfumers really, it's quite often mentioned by perfumers, even more so than, than average people. Uh, and uh, an absolutely remarkable smell. Don't everybody go and rush out and blind buy a bottle. I think it was kind of aimed towards ladies, but it certainly can be worn by men. I believe uh, Sean Connery apparently was a big fan of it, the, the former James Bond, who, who sadly passed away recently. Um, so, yeah, a really, really powerful, potent, complex fragrance. As you rightly said, the civet there is, is quite a factor. So it's a little bit funky in the base, so watch out. But it's an absolute masterpiece. I just slightly favour Michoir de Michoir by Guerlain which is, many people say, in a similar vein, just a little bit less funky for me. 
Uh, but I, I think Jiki is incredibly interesting. And would I be right in saying, I, well, I'm certainly right in saying Civet's involved, that you have a fragrance that perhaps takes a few cues from Jiki or certainly has a significant Civet note, which is Civet Cat Sheepra? Yeah, my Civet Cat Sheepra, it, it, it's similar to Jiki in that um, the opening is the bright citrus, the bright light notes in combination with the civet. Mm. So you get the stinky civet and the citrus brightness at the same time they hit you. <laughs> and then, just like Cheeky, towards the middle, dries down towards the florals. Cheeky has less woods than my civet. Mm. is more transparent. Okay. Towards the middle, Cheeky is more like Fougere. Uh-huh. And then um, they both dry down rather um, amber-like. But my appreciation for Guerlain, if anybody from Guerlain is watching, give me a ticket. I want to come and I want to <laughs> walk around your mansion and I want to pick your brain and I want to go to your museums and I want to see, because I want to learn everything about that house. They're, they're my most influential um, house. They're amazing, man. They're really, really good, really good. Uh, with you all the way on that one yeah really amazing historic french house so that and yeah uh, good to know who your favorite overall house is great choice cannot argue with that one so we've had uh, some great ones from the, the pantheon of the hall of fame of fragrances that was number three what's right. number four please Carol. Uh, moving right. to the 80s Oh. So, Dan, I think we're about the same age. Mm -hmm. I think we were born on the tail end of irresponsible parenting. Okay. Um, or I just feel like life was a little bit more simple. Our mm. parents still kind of recovering from the 70s or 60s, me, 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 let's get high and not really worry about tomorrow sort of thing. Mm. Um, I remember being like four years old and my parents having a bar in their living room and everybody, all of our neighbors having bars and shag carpets and everything was kind of orange or brown. <laughs> right. And really good music and everybody had an awesome stereo system and records. Yeah. I don't know if your parents, um, but I can't say, you know, I don't know if my mom would deny it or not. I don't know if, if my parents were high on Coke, but certainly probably the people that came over to party with them were, and you know, they have like, you know, um, ABBA playing in the background or, 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 um, Jefferson Starship or yes. And, I, I just feel like it was a more innocent, more fun time, a bit hedonistic, mm. certainly more sexist, but, you know, this is when a time when, you know, a lady could be a housewife and, and the dad maybe worked for the same company forever. So a little yep. bit more simple life. Mm. This, I can remember guys, my, you know, my uncles, right? I had so many uncles. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like your dad's friend or your mom's friend was always Uncle Bob or Uncle Yes, Bob. Or Uncle, Uncle Bert. Bert. Yeah, Uncle, it wasn't my uncle. Yeah. Uncle with the mustache who was fucking yeah. hammered and drunk all the time in the corner. Yeah. Oh, go get Uncle Joey. He's, you know, asleep. So this is Coram, and I have to meet um, an interesting fellow later on this afternoon. I was telling you about him, so we'll put some Coram on. Kind of fire. Uh... <laughs> He'll know you've arrived, yeah. Yes. <laughs> You don't have to carry a um, a boombox with you, and and actually, Coram would be perfect. Coram, like um, David Bowie, the Golden Years. Yeah. Carry that boombox with you. Spray yourself with a shit ton of Coram. Make mm -hmm. an entrance when you come in. You know, and just say, "I have arrived." So, it's. Opens up with a nice citrus. It's fresh, but very quickly, 
You go straight to the hairy chested leisure suit, green leather. Very. 1980s newscaster. Hmm. Slap in the behind of the secretary. They <laughs> read out at work, sort of thing. And I think there should be a word in the English language where, you know, we say nostalgia, but if you're nostalgic for something, it's like you're nostalgic for something you've experienced. Yeah. But there's got to be a word for being nostalgic about something that you can hardly remember. Because when you're really young, it's a dream. Yeah. We need I like a that. Yeah. And I think it can be called quorum. Right. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I'm nostalgic for the 70s, even though I was only born in 77 or the 60s, but yeah, yeah, or, or the early 80s. So, of course, Quorum, an early 80s release, it kind of sits a little bit alongside maybe things like Polo Green, maybe kind of Chorus, Yves Saint Laurent, um, yes. Dior's uh, Jules, the kind of uh, those kind of phrases, Oster de la Regenta, Paul Louis Antaeus. That kind of stuff. It's one of those. Oh. Something about it, it never seems the most glamorous to me because I'm not so familiar with the House of Puig and the bottle is very um, 80s uncle's bathroom design is so dated. Uncle's 39. You, you got it. Yeah. Sorry. Go, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Um, you know who I think, uh, Dan, I completely agree with you. I think Tom Ford has brought it back a bit. Oh, really? His leathers have some okay. similarities. You know, it's not quite that pushy, but it's got the so the prime material mm. here is called IBQ, Isobutyl Quinlon. Oh, really? That green leather. I'll have to send you just a, a vial of it because once you smell it, you're like, I know this. It's that green leather, bitter leather, almost iodine smelling. Yes. This one is, I find. Uh, I've got a bottle and I must admit, I, I've tried to really get into it and I've always liked some of those others that I mentioned a bit more, but maybe I need to give it more of a go. But it, it's quite challenging actually by today's standards of what we're used to smelling on, on people. It's, it's definitely a hairy chested, manly fragrance. It's hairy chested. It's very suede like. It's very dry. Mm. It's got notes of iodine. It's almost like this chemically, and it's very, very deep green at the same time. Yeah. Now think of this when you smell it. You got green bell peppers, and then slice them, and freshly cut green bell peppers. Mm. It also smells like that in a very dry leather. Okay. So that was that my number four. That's really good. I feel like I'm learning a lot from you and uh, I, I view things in a different way when you describe them, which is, is really good. You know, you're, you're giving us technical descriptions, but they're also, um, they paint a picture in my mind at the same time that I can understand as, a, as more of a layman. So I think it's really cool. Um, by the way, I think you, you, you have been offering some online fragrance uh, perfumery courses. Absolutely, absolutely. And are they still a, a thing? Anybody can join up anytime. Just okay, well, I'll put a link in the description. If you want to hear more of this kind of stuff and really learn about it, I'm, I'm tempted now, but I, I, I'm totally impractical, so I'll never make a perfume, but I'm, I love hearing about it. What's the best link that I could put? Would it be your Instagram or I'll, I'll put it in the description? Contact me on Instagram, guys. Okay. Contact me there. Um, and you, you post information about them on your Instagram page? Yeah. They presumably. Can... So directly message me okay well there's a link to your instagram in the description so people dm you there uh matthew's very good at communicating with people who, who you can uh, might be something people would consider doing so that's number four we have only one left but we are, i do as, as i say insist on one highlighted fragrance from your own brand so you can put that either last or next it's up to you so what's next looks like you haven't decided yet <laughs> okay okay uh <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll take out my um, golden guy, I guess. Okay. okay. This is a Meleg original. If you don't have it to hand, I do. So you don't, we can let me show it. So this is the one that I bought myself. And it isn't a sort of stereotypical Mr. Smelly favorite fragrance, which tends to be uh, a, a, an aromatic fougere or a green chypre or an old fashioned citrus aromatic. But despite being typecast, by my own eff efforts. I do like many other things too. And I thought this wonderfully boozy, rich fragrance was really something remarkable. And one of my favorite 
tobacco fragrances without uh, treading on your toes because you're going to explain about it in a minute uh, it, for instance it actually contains real tincture of tobacco rather than a some kind of accord to represent tobacco and i think tincture of chambord liquor yes can you explain more please chambord liquor is like blackberry liquor it's, uh, i'm not a huge drinker um i think you drink more beer than me uh, I, I drink know. more beer than most people on this earth yes <laughs> you're a proper brit <laughs> i am so um it's uh, chambord liquor is uh just a dark jammy um it's quite nice you know it's very fruity um you can have it with ice cream for sure with uh sweets and desserts um and then tobacco absolute or tobacco a lot of guy a lot of people might think you know it's this really bitter smoky sort of thing tobacco is not like that it's got so many nuances of like cassis or blackberry or blueberry just any of the dark purple um, fruits, any of them. It's a melange of those. So if we were to take like blackberries, blueberries, um, and cassis and mash it up and make a, a fruit leather from these, a fruit leather, and you smell it, maybe a little bit of rose petals in there as well, you really will get like, like a, a kind of, um, that's what tobacco absolute smells like. It's got this sweetness in it. So anyways, um, long story short, I used to hang out in a place called the Golden Guy in Tokyo, which is like next to uh, the red light district, actually inside of the world's largest light red light district. If you go to Tokyo, it's very safe. It's very tourist friendly. Um, and uh, actually anywhere in Japan, you'll never have any problems with any mm. danger whatsoever. It's very civilized people. but. You are allowed to eat and drink in these bars in the Golden Guy. Um, and I don't know if you have these in, in, in London, but these tiny little micro bars, each with their own unique theme. So you can go bar hopping in the Golden Guy, um, but you're going to be surrounded with like tobacco smoke and then these sweet liqueurs and all sorts of drinks. So I just wanted to capture that kind of hedonistic smoky liqueurs atmosphere um, that you would experience bar hopping in the golden guy. So that's, that's, that's uh, guy. Guy I think, road, G-A-I, it's like alleyway, the golden right. way. It's the golden alleyway, effectively. Yeah, well, you certainly captured it. Well, I've never been there. And I, I must say, we do, I don't think we have anything quite equivalent to that. I think it's sort of unique, probably, in a way, from what you've, what you've shown me about that, that place. It's an absolutely incredibly beautiful fragrance. It really is. Um, sometimes tobacco and boozy type fragrances, to me, I, I, I find they're not the ones I gravitate towards because they can be a bit much, a bit gloopy and, and unctuous. So Tobacco Vanilla by Tom Ford, I, I kind of respect it, but it's, it's not my absolute favorite. Very sweet. But this, I mean... Um, mm. The, 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 this one is absolutely it's actually very wearable it's it's not overpoweringly dense to me you know i would feel fine going to any kind of casual occasion or dressed up or whatever in this one but it's got that beautiful beautiful natural smelling tobacco and a beautiful booziness and all kinds of other complex things you can find out if you, you go to the uh, the link in the description where they've got the proper note listing it's really really sensational and i really you know forget Bentley for Men Intense or something. I do still like that as a good cheapie, but if you're looking for a really good kind of boozy, amazing fragrance that's kind of, uh, what's the word, rich, decadent, fires up your imagination, that kind of thing. This really, really does it, and it's, it's something amazing. And I love that you've got the real tobacco thing. And, of course, naturally, I think we, we, when we first hear about there being a tobacco note in fragrances, some of us think, oh, well, that's not very good because you think of the smell of fag smoke, you know, cigarettes or whatever. But, you know, even if I remember in, in school, we used to have tins with the words that the teacher had cut out and written. It was a tobacco tin of golden Virginia tobacco. Yeah. And that was like, it just smelled really beautiful, actually. Yeah. And my mum was like, no, it doesn't, because I don't want you to grow up to smoke when I used to say how nice it smelled. But the, the actual tobacco, even of the most 
basic type that you probably bought for, to roll up your cigarettes is a, is a very pleasant smelling thing, but even more so with the, the fancy type that you no doubt use. So love it. Absolutely highly recommended. Love it. Love it. Bought my own bottle. Wasn't sent it free. Uh, and, you know, it was one I don't regret having in the collection for one moment. You have one choice left. What is it? Thank you. All right. I'm going to go with one you'd never think I'd go with. Uh-huh. Never. Right. Ah, squid. Yeah. Zoologist squid. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought that would be your favorite. I don't know. I have so many. I like I like all of them just because they're different for, for different reasons, right? Mm, yeah. What is it about this one then? Well, what I like about squid by zoologists first of all i really respect respect the brand mm. because i think victor is always trying to do something different victor Wong, the man behind the brand uh the, the the main man who curates all the perfumes from the different perfumers yeah and he's always trying to find you know if you buy the the zoologist collection you're going to get something different from every bottle. So it's a wide range. And um, from a business perspective, that's quite a bit of a risk. Yeah. Right? And what I like about um, this perfume is its simplicity in that it is a celebration of ambergris. Mm -hmm. So it's an aquatic ambergris mineral sort of perfume um very easy to wear and i think you could probably layer this perfume with so many other ones and i think it would really enhance quite a few perfumes especially if you were to layer um zoologists uh, uh um squid with some citrus mm -hmm. you know, layered um zoologist squid with for example let's say Creed's Aventus or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it would go fantastic. It would just make a nice, uh, there's there's an airiness to them, right? There's saltiness to both of them, actually. And um, now the main materials in these marine, aquatic, um, or let's say salty or um, ambergris type materials, it's ambroxan. And ambroxan, right. absolutely, it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. it's very very beautiful material that is of course the sort of synthetic representation of ambergris it is exactly mm. right um, and I do have now ambergris and ambroxan is this it's woody it's dry okay this is the landscape I get from amber mm. Or ambroxan. Mm -hmm. They're somewhat similar, slightly different, but you know, off the west coast of um, uh, parts of, I think, the northwest coast of Africa, you have these giant sand dunes and they come up right up against the ocean. Right. So the way that I picture the scent of ambergris or ambroxan is that you have these giant sand dunes, they come up right against the ocean. It's a very hot, salty place. You get the winds from the ocean, the cool winds, and imagine there's a log on the beach, but it's bone dry, it's white, 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 white. Mm. And so ambroxan, ambergris, it smells of this uh, very clean, clean, dry cedar, very clean, dry cedar covered in misty salt and minerals from the ocean so it's simultaneously very aquatic and dry and yeah. that's a property that only exists with ambroxan yeah. so it's quite beautiful it's actually quite beautiful in its simplicity another perfume that i like for this minerality mm. is Tom Ford's Oud Mineral all right mm -hmm. Oud Mineral and zoologists 
um, squid are both very abstract mm. modern creations, yet they, it captures, it, it's quite beautiful. It's quite beautiful. Mm. Um, to me, if it was like a painting, it would be like just a white, abstract modern white painting with gesso and just little flicks and layers of texture here and there, slightly off-white, you know, slightly, slightly off-white pink, slightly, slightly off-white blue, like a very, very washed out opal. That's the squid perfume. And, yeah. and, and, um, Oud Mineral, you can smell, I can right. smell in this one, the cedary frankincense. I can smell in it the ocean. I can smell the seaweed a little bit. I can smell the bone dry wood. Mm. I can smell slightest, slightest pepperiness. I can smell so many things in it. So um, it's quite pleasant, especially Very. Like stuff. So, so everybody go ahead and try that. Um, no doubt, you know, Zoologist is a good brand. And oh, uh, yeah. so, so that was my kind of, uh, I know you would never, because my perfumes tend to be very, very thick and they don't mm. have the transparency to them, the shine through it. But uh, it's, it's beautiful. Okay, brilliant. I like that one a lot too from what I've tried. I think I've uh, got a travel spray somewhere like you. And I mean, when we say aquatic fragrance, many people might think of uh, Aqua di Chio or Lo de Se, and they're very good. But this is kind of really an aquatic smell that captures some of those real sea smells in a slightly more complex and, and artistic way, I think, but very, very wearable. But it's, it, you know, when we say aquatic, this is a real niche aquatic artistic fragrance, really, really good and extremely wearable and, and versatile. A lot of the zoologists ones actually are some of them a little bit more challenging and artist you may be just artistic an unlikely signature scent for most of us but squid could be it's really really good stuff and so quirky and strange you'd think well that's a non-starter calling us fragrance squid who's going to want to wear that but his brand's done brilliantly well so you've got to hand it to him really very brave uh, concept the whole thing that he does isn't it but it's been a huge success Beautiful. I, I have a, a custom kind of perfume myself that, that is um, partially inspired by squid. It's just called the Pacific Northwest. I like and it. Squid with a lot of pine notes. So it's kind of like, you know, a block away from my place, we've got the ocean, and then we've got Stanley Park, these, you know, 80 foot, 80 meter high giant ancient pines. Mm -hmm. With the landscape. Um, and there's a slight touch of frankincense in here, which is, it's very naturalistic. And I, I love the salt accords. I love the smell mm. of salt and minerals. So um, it, it just goes to show you that sometimes these synthetic materials like ambroxan, which actually is in nature, mm. it's isolated, it's just distracted from it. You know, so it's, it's, it's not fair to say ambroxan is not natural. It's in nature it's just that the mm -hmm. are able to create the exact thing in isolation yeah it just goes to show you that these synthetics can be more true to nature than than um, natural materials can sometimes that's a very long story we'll talk about it one day but um i love it the airiness and you know it's beautiful yeah. I like your defense of ambroxan there, yeah, because it is a much maligned uh, ingredient sometimes in, in the world of people who talk about fragrances who perhaps associate it with uh, being the, the, the overused note in things like Dior Sauvage or whatever. But uh, of course, it turns up in so many other things that you, you might be amazed, actually. It's, it's obviously not something that appears usually in the note listing that a lot of people put out there, but it's, it's in a lot of things. And I love your, you've made it, me sort of re-examine my overall view of it as a fragrance in, ingredient there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the amazing descriptions. I feel like we've all learned a ton here and we're going to get you back on the show some more to, to talk about some more stuff. Great to get your fragrance journey from, yeah, real great variety there from the vanilla with the, your early experiences and a whole ton of other stuff.
Bye. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been an absolute thrill, as always, to talk to you and a real honour to have you on the show. Uh, pleasure. I love talking with you and I can't wait for COVID to be over. I'm coming to London, man. Two places I've never been is New York and London. I can't believe it. Ah. Going this summer, there's nothing. Yeah. I'm going to those two cities. I'm coming to see. I'm going to go. We're going to have some beers. And I want you to, you know, we'll go look at some perfumeries and whatnot, whatever. We'll get in some trouble. It sounds absolutely amazing. So I'll bid fun farewell to our viewers. Thank you ever so much for watching. We'll see you in the next ever episode, whatever you're doing in life. Let's project. Bye-bye. Thank you.